Well, we've come to the very end of a series uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, and I've been studying this for over a year, and I want to tell you this sermon series has changed my life. I don't know about you, but it's changed me. And we've come to the very last verse, and today is Baptism Sunday, and I don't have notes for you. I've just got a simple idea, but you may want to write something down on your phone or take a picture of some of the notes on the screen. But we come to the very end, and it's interesting, this last couple of verses at the very end. Let me show it to you. And so it was, when Jesus had ended his sermon saying these things, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. They were shocked. They were amazed. They were stunned. They, the word is astonished because they couldn't believe what he was saying. What he was saying was so opposite to the way that they thought. They'd always thought a certain way. The scribes, the Pharisees, they had their interpretations of the scriptures, and they were the experts. And so here comes Jesus saying something that is the total opposite of the way they think. And of course, they're like, who does he think he is? And what gives him the right to say this? And by what authority would he ever say these things? There's, there's like, he's, he's crazy. There's no way. And they resisted what he had to say. There's always two kinds of people. So there's the one person who's astonished, like there's no way, and they resisted, but then there was another group of people who heard Jesus, and their response was they were astonished. We've never heard anything like this. We never understood this before. And they just, they, they followed it, and they, they stepped into it, and they, they, they began to, to walk in a different way than they had before which I think is such a profound thing because what Jesus was saying was so different than what they had heard. Let me take you back to the very first verse. I'm not gonna be able to go through all of the astonishing. It took me a whole year already, but I, I wanna maybe next week just go back and hit some highlights. But today, let me just take you to the first verse where it says, God blesses those who recognize their need for him. So God blesses people who recognize, I don't understand it all, but I need to get close to this. I don't understand it all, but I see God in this man. I don't understand it all, but um, I, need to, I, need to, I need God. I need God in my life. The next beatitude, God recognizes, God blesses people who recognize their need for him. They have this humility to know they need God. And then they start to mourn the condition of the world. And they start saying things like, something's got to change. And then the next beatitude, which is God blesses the humble, where they realize it's not just the world that needs to change. I need to change. There's an, there's an ownership of it. And so, so Jesus hits people two different ways. Some people would say, well, how in the world could he say such things? And then there were some that says, I don't understand it all, but I need to get closer. I need to understand. I need to take a step. That's what you're going to see today. One of the things about the Sermon on the Mount is that it's just one big sermon on humility. God loves humility. God opposes the proud. God resists the plans of the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He, he responds to people who simply turn his way, and that's what you're going to see today on Baptism Sunday. You're going to see people who have simply decided, I don't understand it all, but I know that something's got to change, and I know that I've got to change, and I'm ready to follow Jesus. And you're going to see that person after person as they step forward and get into that water and be baptized. So I thought today I would just answer one simple question that if you're going to follow Jesus, number one, uh, who is Jesus? That'd be important to know. And then the second question is, help me understand what baptism is all about. So I want to take you to the very first words ever spoken about Jesus. If I was just going to introduce somebody to him for the first time, I might go to the gospel of Matthew, which was the first gospel ever written, and I might show them the first sentence about Jesus ever written in the whole world. And it says this, the beginning of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the first time the word Jesus is ever written down in the history of the world. This is the beginning of the good news or the gospel. And then the writer Mark, he, he quotes a prophecy from the book of Isaiah that as it is written in the prophet, behold, I will send a messenger before you 
who will prepare your way before you. He's talking about the Messiah when he comes. There's a messenger that's going to come. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And Mark says that guy came among us and his name was John. John showed up and came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, there's a whole lot there. But I know you hear that word repentance and an American mind says, stop doing bad things. But that's not what that word means. I've been trying to teach you for weeks now that the word repentance means change the way that you think. It's a Greek word, metamorphi, metamorphosis, change. Change the way that you think. There's something about changing the way that you think that has to do with your sins being removed. So change the way that you think because the way that you see things is the not the way that God sees things. You ought to be careful when you say, like those original uh, Pharisees, well, that's just the way it is. Well, that's just the way it appears to you currently. And there's a big difference. Anytime you say, well, that's just how it is, and that's what I know, and those are the facts, well, that's how it occurs to you currently. And there are humble people who are, who are able to admit, like, I don't know everything, but the way it seems to... Jesus is saying things that are totally different than what I ever understood before. And so some people were latching on to that. So John comes saying, if you're ever going to grasp the, the, and see the Messiah and get him and understand him, there's going to have to be a change in the way that you think for you to recognize him. So what happened was, in all the land of Judea... People started coming out from Jerusalem and Judea, and they went out, and they were all baptized by him, which is amazing because you don't understand this. The only people getting baptized in those days were non-Jewish people who felt they needed to become Jewish. So baptism was the, the ritual cleansing uh, Jewish ritual that said, okay, you are literally being washed away and there is a new you and the new you is now a follower of Judaism. So you had an audience that were listening to John the Baptist and he's saying, repent, change the way you think and get baptized so your sins can be removed and make way for the Messiah who's coming. And a bunch of the people went, what are you talking about? I'm already a Jew. I'm already right with God. I don't need to be baptized. Why are you telling us that we have to be bad? That's not theologically correct. <laughs> and then there were some people who were just, I'm jacked up. I'm messed up. I know that I have dirt and sin in my life. And if you say this is the way to get right with God, then I'm getting in the water. And they just listened and they heard and they took a step of faith and they followed. And John was separating sheep from goats in that first sermon saying, some of you aren't going to get this, but those who have the humble heart to recognize their need for God. And that's what was happening. People were standing there, a, a big crowd of humanity going, um, I, I recognize I need God. Something's got to change and I got to change. While there were some that were standing on the side self-righteously going, well, I don't know that I need this. I'm, I'm already right. And John, sensing this resistance, he says, look, you haven't seen nothing yet. After me, I'm just the messenger. After me, one will come who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. Indeed, I baptize you with water, but when he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In other words, there is more to experience than you are currently experiencing. There's more of God that's going to come that you have no idea about. Like, like the, the Holy Spirit that would anoint the prophets could come to you and be a part of your life. You don't know what that's about. And so, so John's making this appeal like there's more to experience than you know. Repent, change the way that you think, and follow him. Get ready for his coming. And people were coming into the water. Now... Look at the next verse. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth in the Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. I don't know if you understand how big a deal that was because Jesus has no sin. He doesn't need to be baptized. He's right with God. But Jesus, coming upon that crowd, identifies himself with the mess of the humanity responding to that message saying, we need God. We need to follow him. And Jesus says, I'm with those guys. I'm not going to stand up here on the side like those who say, We're, we don't need this. And Jesus makes a choice to identify with the humble. Oh, I love that. 
Jesus identifies with the people that he's being sent to save. And he gets into that water. And another gospel says that John looks at him and says, what are you doing? You should be baptizing me. I shouldn't be baptizing you. And he says, no, this is the right thing to do. It's just the right thing to do. When I look at the situation, I'm not going to be over there. I'm going to be right here. Identifying with the humble, with those who recognize their need for God. And Jesus is baptized. And when he's baptized, remember, this is the beginning of the gospel. This baptism is the beginning of the gospel. In this baptism, the heavens open, they part, the Spirit descended upon Jesus. So since I got a bunch of young people in the room, a dove didn't descend on Jesus. It says, where's your, remember English class? The Spirit descended like a dove. So he's making a simile. It's an analogy, okay? But a dove didn't descend on Jesus. I don't care what the movie showed you. All right? It says the Spirit of God descended on Jesus. So that's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened, a voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son in who I am so pleased. And God affirms him and blesses him. Note these two things happen. There's, there's some things I want to pull out of that story and just show you. Just, just in this little beginning of the gospel, do you understand that there's a picture here for all of us? Because right after this, right after these two things happens, it's just a few days later that Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, it's here, it's fulfilled, the time is now, the kingdom of God is here, it's at hand, repent, not stop doing bad things. <laughs> I know i got to get you guys to start thinking of this right. Change the way that you think and believe in the gospel. And that's what I'm going to ask a bunch of you to do today. There's a bunch of people ready to be baptized, and there are some people in this room that need to be baptized. You didn't even know it was Baptism Sunday, but we're ready for you. We actually have everything that you need. We've got the towels and the clothes and the places to change and everything. And I believe that God is going to come and speak to some people today in this very moment, just like he did on that first day where the kingdom of God is announced and somebody has the ears to hear, I know I need to be right with God. And you're going to step out and join those who are already prepared to be baptized. And you're going to be one of those to be baptized today. Let me break this down that what Jesus is actually doing here is when he says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. What he's actually announcing is, number one, he's announcing the reign of God. He's saying our God reigns, not that he's going to come one day and reign and make everything right or he's going to someday when you go to heaven when you die. No, God reigns right now. God reigns right now. Like God is reigning. He's in charge. He's in control. He is here right now. The, the reign, the rule of God is here. Do you have the faith to believe that? This wasn't new information to the Jews. This wasn't a new information to the, to the people listening. All through history, the word of God had been through prophet after prophet, declare among the nations that our God reigns. In fact, that's the purpose of Israel in the great history of the world, that through this one people, God would declare to everybody that he reigns. So that's an incredible thought. God reigns. Say God reigns when you're enslaved and in Egypt, stand up and say, but God still reigns. When you have suffered your worst humiliations and your defeats, stand up and say, but our God still reigns. When evil has its way in the world, stand up and say, but our God still reigns. He still reigns. When you look at what's happening right now in Israel, the people of God don't wring their hands. The true people of God say, our God still reigns. The darkness tried to extinguish the light, but the darkness could never overcome it. God still reigns. That requires a complete change of the natural thinking order. Because if you're in the world today and you're staring at that without any idea of who God is, you're looking at this and saying, this is fragile. This is bad. This, this, is, this is the beginning of a cascade of problems. And I'm nervous and I'm afraid. And what do we do? And isn't this what we do in our own lives when we encounter problems that we can't solve and we don't have the resources for, but we desperately try to grab on to and control and manipulate. And it's, if it's going to be, it's up to me. And, and the people of God have always been able to say, well, no, it's not out of control. 
It may be bad. It may be dark. It may be evil. They may, they may not be doing what God wants, but God still reigns. And I believe this, that faith is a gift that comes from God. So if you have the decision to say, I don't understand it all, but I know some things need to change, and I know that I need to change, but if God says he reigns, then he reigns. I believe God will give you a gift of faith that will allow you to actually experience the presence of God in your situation. That he's here, that he's present, that I'm secure, that he's, he's talking to me, he's guiding me, he's listening to me, he's showing me what to do. Our God reigns. There's something about just declaring that God reigns that puts me in a proper place of humility. Because when I look at the evil in the world, my response has to be in some way, you know, something's got to change. Guess what? I need to change too. I'm part of the evil that's in this world because there's evil in me. And the other way of thinking is there's nothing wrong with me. It's those people over there. There's something about a finger-pointing spirit that will prevent people from ever coming to a place of contrition. And contrition is when you recognize your need for God. And so there's something about our co-responsibility, you know, with the evil in the world to say, God, I know I need you, and something needs to change, and I need to change. And God says, I see you, and God comes to you. So Jesus comes declaring the reign of God, and it, and it makes people have to decide, am I going to come under his reign, or am I going to resist his reign? But that's what Jesus came proclaiming, the reign of God is here now. Now, it came to pass, remember in those days that Jesus comes to be baptized. Let's talk about that part of the story. Jesus is baptized by John. He's 30 years old. He's grown. He, he goes down into this water and is immersed. And it's incredible to me because he doesn't have to do it. But he chooses to identify with that whole train of people who are, who are humble, I've said this a hundred times, and I'll say it a hundred times more, that God loves the humble. He blesses the humble. He resists the proud, but he gives grace and he gives mercy to the humble. This is the way of the kingdom of God, and there is no other way. That's why baptism is such an incredible picture of humility. It's a picture of a death, and it's a picture of a resurrection. When a person goes under the water, it's like that person died. And when they come out of the water, it's like they come alive. And there's something about a baptism that requires, well, something's got to die in me too. That's why Jesus, and that's why in, in the great scheme of it all, you've got Jesus giving this, the beginning of the gospel starts with a baptism where people are being confronted with the choice. Are you going to remain resistant or are you going to be humble? And so Jesus was baptized by Don in the Jordan, and immediately coming up out of that water, God begins to respond to the situation. It says the Spirit of God descends upon him by the dove. And that's the second, like a dove. And that is the second thing. The Spirit of God descends on Jesus, anointing Jesus for the work that God had called him to do. The Spirit of God came upon him. That, the Spirit of God can only come upon the humble. And I know God must have just looked at that situation and, and, and uh, you know, Jesus, Jesus was just a man like you and me. He's, a, he's, he's God, he came from the Father, but he became a human being. So all the stuff that Jesus is about to do, blind eyes being opened, people being set free of their addictions and their captivity and their, their bondages and their demon possession and all of that, it's all gonna be done through the work of the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus goes into that water, it says that's when the Holy Spirit descends upon him. Why would God ever give the Holy Spirit to someone who still thinks that they're the ones in charge of their own life? There's something about the humility when God says, now I can give you my spirit. Because now you're ready. I know the next part, I gotta keep this moving. A voice came secondly saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There's like an affirmation of the Father. This is the third thing. Jesus was affirmed as the, as the beloved Son of God in his baptism. And I know you can't surprise an all-knowing God. I mean, it's not like you can, you can surprise him and like he didn't see it coming. 
I mean, I wonder, I mean, I wonder when Jesus came to that baptism, there's no way he could have surprised God, but I, I hear it this way in my mind, like God just going, I knew he was going to do it. He didn't have to, but I knew he was going to do it. I knew he was going to identify with the humble. I'm so proud of him. And he explodes into this public affirmation. And, and, and this is my beloved son. And that was the relationship that Jesus had with his father. It was so personal. He, he would pray in the most intimate of terms. Uh, he would say the word Abba. He called him, you know, like, like daddy. Like with my son still, 30 years old, ever says dad. He doesn't say daddy anymore. <laughs> but if he did. <laughs> it's the best sound in the whole world, you know, when you've got that little, or, or that little tiny grandson of mine, you know, he's looking up. I'm watching him call his dad daddy. That's a, that Aramaic term, daddy, that's Jesus said, address your father like this. It wasn't just, he, and nobody prayed like that. Nobody was praying Abba. Nobody was praying father in those days. But Jesus had this relationship with his father, and he's affirmed by his father. God loved him. And I want you to know that this picture is not just all about Jesus. It's also what's available to you. I've been a pastor for over 30 years, 33 now. And when I see people get baptized, I see all three of these things happen. One, there has to be some kind of acknowledgement like, God, you reign. I don't. It's not about me anymore. I know that I need God. And I know that something's got to change in the way that I think. And I'm saying yes to you God, you're the, Lord. you're the Lord. If you say be baptized, then I'm getting baptized. So there's an acknowledgement of the reign of God. The second thing that happens in that water is I see the Spirit of God come upon people. They can't explain it, but the, but the Spirit of God always comes to the humble. And there's something about that moment when people are surrendering themselves basically to that moment where they're dying to self. And I tell our guys all the time, this isn't some baptism where you grab people and just throw them under the water. I don't know, have you ever seen that happen? Be baptized. <laughs> you know, they, I'm not, no, no, we don't want to do that. We, what we want is for people to literally get up in that water, all you getting baptized, and surrender yourself to the water. Like, let your knees go and just collapse into the water. Like, I am surrendering myself to God. And then those people will help stand you back up. That's the way to do a baptism. And you come alongside and you help them stand back up. But, but there's the, it's, it's a moment of surrender. It's saying, God, take my whole life. And God going, all right, I can bless you with my spirit now. And God deposits inside of them the love of the Father. You are my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. And I see that, you will see that on the faces of people today as they come out of the water, as they encounter the Spirit of God and the affirmation of God in a way that they never knew before because it only comes through humility. And God wants to have that kind of relationship with you. Let me, let me just give you one more verse. In the Bible, there's a prophecy about Jesus in the book of Jeremiah. And through the Holy Spirit, Jeremiah writes, and he's thinking it's just about him, but it's also about Jesus. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you. Well, do you know God, by his spirit, says that to you too? Listen to me. Before you were born, before you were even formed in the womb, like God knew everything about you. He created you. He chose your eye color. He chose the color of your skin. He chose how you're made. He's chosen your personality. He's chosen your height. He chose everything about you, and he made you. You're not an accident. It's not just two people coming together. Before the two people came together, God formed you and, and created you. He saw you. Don't be changing what, don't try to change something that God already has a plan for. Amen. God's got a plan. Before, before I, I formed you, he says, I knew you. I know everything about it. I know, I know what happened. I know the school. I know what took place. I know the, the situation. I know, your, I know what they said and I know what they did. And so many people are spending their lives frozen because they're like, they're listening to what everybody else says. And God says, don't listen to them. I'm the one that knows you. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. I see your value. I've, I see the value. I made you. I know you. 
Then he says this, I love this. He says, I sanctified you. <laughs> I love that. Before I was born, yeah, I didn't know that. I thought when I was a kid, I had to get saved every Sunday, you know, because I thought I, I've added some dirt to my life apparently and I'm in trouble. And God says, listen, listen, listen. Before you were even born, I saw you and I made a way for you to be completely sanctified. I chose you. And you know, that's incredible. Can you imagine that? That, that God, before you were born, loved you and saw you, and then he sanctified you. And you say, well, how did that happen? I've still got is issues in my life. I know, and that's called grace, and that's called mercy, and that's called God giving you something that you don't even deserve. And God's saying, before you were born, I, I, I already made a way for you. Just respond to it. And I thank God that I'm not living up all the way to that image yet, but I'm not where I used to be. I'm growing, I'm becoming, I'm changing. But he sanctified me. And then he says, he ordained me. Put that up there one more time. He ordained me. So ordained is just a big word when somebody lays their hands and says, you're the man or you're the woman or you're ready for whatever the assignment is. And all that saying is, God says, you don't need anybody else. Before you were born, I already put inside of you everything that you need to accomplish the purpose for your life. I already put all that inside of you already. It's already in there. I've ordained you. Can you imagine? That's how, this is not God that's out there somewhere. He sees you. He knows you. He's, he's sanctified you. He's, he's ordained you for your life purpose. That's why, that's why in baptism you step into. That's why it says this is the beginning of the good news. This is good news that God knows all of it. Even the bad things, even the evil things, even the suffering that happened. He says, I know, I saw it. But I'm going to use all of that and weave it in and I'm gonna use it for my purpose in your life. And that's what God did in my life, and if he did it for me, he'll do it for you. So this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus. It starts with a baptism. It's a, a humble moment where people are gonna stand up and say, I recognize my need for God, and I know I gotta change, and I'm ready. And I think many people are gonna jump into that, and I think there's some resistance even today in the room I can you know, I have to believe that there's someone going, I don't know, maybe this is just the story of Jesus. How do you know this is for me? Well, let's just end with Jesus' words. What did Jesus say? Because Jesus, the beginning of the gospel was a baptism, but the end of the gospel was a cross where he died and then he rose again. And right before he went to that cross, look at what he said. I'll ask the Father and he will give who? He'll give you the Holy Spirit who will never leave you, who will be in you, and who will lead you into all truth. No, I won't abandon you as orphans. I'll come to you. God doesn't stand at a distance just letting you mess up. He says, I'll come to you. And when I'm raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me. And I, look at how close this is. I'm in you. Those who love me, okay, those are the ones who will obey my, go to the next slide. Those who love me are the ones who will accept my commandments and obey me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. See, there's the affirmation. And I will love them and reveal myself to each one of them. This is the good news of Jesus. So here's how I want to end this today. The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is here. It's right now. It's at hand. And I say to every person in here, repent. Like change the way that you think and believe the good news. And the baptism is open to every person. And you say, well, I was baptized as a baby. Well, good for you. I mean, your parents knew. I'm glad that they did that. But when, when have you decided to follow Jesus? So this doesn't cancel that out. It's just actually affirming what they what they had hoped for you, but you've got to decide. Are, wh wh where are you in the crowd? Are you standing at the side going, I'm good? Or, are you, or, or have you as, a, as an adult, like Jesus, at the age of 30, he said, I'm, I'm going to identify with the humble. I'm going to believe. And I invite everybody to be a part of this today. Many people are already ready to go. We're going to pray. I'm going to invite them to step out this door to my, my, uh, my right. <laughs> Your left. <laughs> I still have to do that. You know that? And um, I'm going to have you head that way, <laughs> that side. 
and uh, our team is ready for you. You guys are going to stand. We're going to worship a little bit, but, uh, but I want to pray for every person in this room who's wrestling with this. There is no greater decision than you'll ever make in your life than to put your life into the hands of God, to say to him, God, you reign. I don't. And that's the first decision. Will you let him be the Lord, the, the ruler, the king of your life? So we're going to pray that prayer right now. Will you guys stand with me? And what that standing is going to do is going to allow some people to step out in the rows between you in just a moment. But I want to lead every person right where, you, where you're sitting in a prayer. So say this prayer with me. God, I know that I need you. I recognize my need for you. And I'm truly sorry for living without you. If that's you, say, yes, God, that's me. Today, God, I surrender to you. And I believe, Jesus, that you are the Son of God who died and you rose again. And now, Lord, I declare that you reign. You are the boss. You're the Lord. You be the king. I surrender my life to you. Say that in your heart. And then say this last part. God, I give you my whole life. I surrender. I'm yours. I'll follow you. Lord, for every person praying this prayer, fill them now with courage and faith to take the next step to follow you. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. You guys ready? If you're ready to be baptized, step out of your seats, come this way, come meet me, and head over to this door. If you're ready, I just want to give you a high five. Shake your hand. Come right now. All right, that's awesome. Head this way. Let me, do, let me do a little traffic control here. All you guys come forward just a little bit. Let's create a little room. Because I think there's a lot of people that still want to be baptized, right? And I know you're looking at this and you're saying, well, I'm not sure. But this is the time. God is calling you to respond. And we have everything that you need. And some of you are going, well, you mean like get wet in front of people? Yes, exactly. It's a humble act. We have everything that you need. We have the towels, we've got clothes, we've got changing tape, changing rooms, everything that you need. 
But I need you to step out and come now and obey the voice of the Lord and head to that door right here on my right and on your left, and our team will pick you up. I'm glad they're still coming. Come on, give God a praise. Here they come. Hey. Come on, let's sing. Come let's on. keep worshiping. Hail us another one. Hail us another one. to celebrate. I see people still heading to that door. Come on, give God praise, everybody. That's so awesome. At this point, you're going to have to go around the back and head up the sidewall to get there, but if God is still speaking to you and you want to be part of this today, don't miss the opportunity. Do what God is telling you to do and be baptized and join in. In fact, I just want to say, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Listen, God wants you to hear his voice today. And I just wanna just take a minute. God, for every person, even that one person who feels that, Lord, they're just hanging right there on the edge. They know they need to give their life to you. I just pray for them. God, I pray that there'd be no hindering spirit that would keep them from you. We just bind that spirit in Jesus' name. And we pray that they will come now and give their lives to you and set them free and deliver them and give them a new life. And Lord, may they not even recognize themselves a year from now. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Okay, put your hands together. Let's keep doing this. And if you need to be baptized, come on down. Get up out of that grave. Say, get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave.
guys would be here like till three o'clock. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna officially say this is the end of this service and we're gonna keep on baptizing. We're gonna do both. So if you need to go get kids from the children's ministry, I'm sure they would appreciate that. Go ahead and get them. And there's another service that's coming in that's gonna be starting at 11.30. So we're just gonna keep baptizing people all day, but thank you so much for coming. I love you guys. God bless you. Keep coming back. Let's keep going.
give God some praise. Thank you, Lord.